And I don't think I saved Fela's band. I just kept it going. Fela's, you know, Fela saved his own band by letting me know that that's the most important thing to him. You know, in our discussions, he used to always tell me. I've, when that's how I know the discussions were coming to an end. My band is the most important thing to me. The music has to be. Maybe even new, you know, maybe when you know you don't have so much time left, you can feel it in your body. Because it was feeding me so much information and I was like, what is this man telling me, you know? Because I was young, you know, how, how am I supposed to understand what this man is saying, you know? But he kept on telling me stuff, you know? So I just stood up and said, we can't allow the band to go. I'll keep playing with the band, you know? So in, in my life today, what I've, the thread that I've allowed to extend into what is happening today in my music and the, with the band, are the things that I believe that I believe in personally, you know, the struggle, the equality, the music being for a purpose, you know, not music just being to sell records, you know, music has to stand for something. Right about the time when I was recording Band on the Run, I went down to Lagos to do it. And the first thing that happened to me was I was accused of stealing the black man's music. He's come here to steal the music. So I said, who's doing that? It was in the newspaper, it was Fella of course. So I got his number, I rang him up and said, hey man, come on, I'm not here to do that. I just, you know, I just love the idea of, I love African music. I just want the kind of atmosphere to it, but I'm certainly not stealing any of your music. He came around to the studio um, and I played him all my stuff and he said, no, nothing like African music. So we became good friends. He invited me out to the African shrine. I mean, you were right in the depths of Africa here. Talk about the black experience. We were the only kind of white people there. And it was very intense. But when this music broke, I ended up just weeping. It was like one of the most amazing musical moments of my life because the band was unbelievable. I remember when I went to Lagos, the second night that I was in Lagos, I was at Fela's house. In fact, I was sitting rapping to him in his bedroom. And you know, part of me, I had to pinch myself because I'm like, damn, is this real? You know, this is one of the baddest musicians on the planet. And I'm sitting yakking with him in his bedroom like it's a normal daily thing. Let's say you flip the coin. I couldn't go to New York and be inside Miles Davis's bedroom talking to him, you know? So it was, uh, I'll always be uh, grateful to him for that. You know, he was very generous towards me. He let me play with the band and it was, it was a great, it was like a dream come true. It was like a religious pilgrimage, you know, in the musical sense. He had shirts on this side, this colored, this colored trousers, and the suits on another side. And it, it could take him about 30, 40 minutes when he first choose the shirt. Then he would put on the trousers and look in the mirror, ah, is this the shoes? If he didn't like it, he would change the shirt. Everything must be, you know, in sync. For a man, <laughs> he, he took care of his appearance. So he would uh, sit in front of the mirror, he would pat it, he would comb it. Because towards the end of his life, he was going bald here. So he would try to you know, push this so that the baldness would not show. <laughs> My father was very vain. <laughs> but he was a ah, beautiful dresser. If you go to bed in the night, like maybe 9 o'clock, you wake up about 12 midnight, you will hear a fella blowing his horn or playing his piano. You go back to bed, you wake up at maybe 2 a.m., he's still at it. You wake up, you sleep, go wake up about 4, he's still at it. Every day of the year, January 1 to January 1, he burnt his life playing, practicing, and perfecting his music. You know, he told me at some point, he said, I wish I had 30 pairs of hands. I said, what for? He said, so I can play the music the way I want to hear it. So that means even what we're hearing is not what it's hearing per se. But this is what the musicians can give him. I remember him saying the point where he went to one jazz club. I can't remember the artist. And when they got into the club, he thought he was so good. And he went to take this trumpet solo. It was out of key, out of tune. And everybody made a big fun of him in the club. And his friend, Wally Bokno, ran out of the club with the trumpet case to embarrass him, so everybody will know that. So when he walked up the stage, I would say, oh, that's that lousy yeah, trumpet. Yeah, he trumpet. Yeah, you know. <laughs> six, 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 sunset. Bernie Hamilton's club. But that was the beginning. That was the baby stages. He was taking baby steps, but those baby steps had the club jumping. And it was there 
that one day, one guy, one most one of those film actors we used to know, one Saturday night, I remember he just after the show was asking fella, do you want to make money? Yes. Fella said, yes, I want to make money. He said, because your music, every night is listening to us. Every night is hearing one track, like about maybe three or four tracks, meaning that the music is too busy. So he said, if you want to make money, really, really, you want to make money, you should do Kiss. Kiss. And Fella said, Kiss. Kiss how? To kiss somebody? No. Keep it simple. You keep it simple, you start making money. You didn't need exceptional skills. You didn't need to be a great eight musician, a literate musician. You didn't need to be able to read and write music. You needed the desire, the ability already there, the foundation already. You can actually pluck the notes, bring your strings out. It's 50 weeks a year. Count all those hours for a certain individual playing time. At the end of the first year, if he wasn't good when he started, by then he will be a maestro on those patterns he has been given to play. He can play with his eyes closed, he can play looking the other way, you know. And by 1977, the, the youngest or the newest person in that entourage had been playing at least four years in Africa 70. So, there was that synergy, there was that communication, there was the camaraderie, the scene and then the unseen, you know, what more can you ask for in a band? Because you have two buses, one for him and the wife, the dancers, one bus for the musician. And when you go, I mean, you are traveling with Africa. I mean, everywhere you go is Africa. Arriving in an hotel, We ran man so many people because the hotels was flipping out, you know, when there was, there was these, all these people arriving, shouting and ah. I, I, uh. But for us, you, you are, you know, it's, it's as you are touring certainly a circus or something like that, you know, when you are so many. So I, the day before recording, I offer Fela um, an automatic tuner. You know, this is a machine we use to tune the guitar, the keyboards, uh, everything. So Fela said, yeah, thank you, thank you very much. A queue of musicians uh, came in front of him and, uh, you know, he would play uh, a note of, on his keyboard, la, 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 and then he would tune every string of uh, every uh, instrument of uh, all the musicians, ask the sax player to play, ba, 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 okay, upper, lower, upper, lower, and all the musicians, one by one, came to, uh, to be tuned to the Fela keyboard. So he watched me with a big smile doing this and said, Jazz Lawson. And I think that Lawson was about, uh, about the tuner. And um, this way of working, I believe, give um, a sound as well. Because uh, being all tuned like this, you know, with, uh, with the ears, like, like in the old days, uh, gives something quite particular. I first encountered Fella on the M4 motorway in the United Kingdom in a Mercedes van, lying in a heap of African dancers on our way back from the show. And somebody put on a cassette. And it was sorrow, tears, and blood. You know, everybody run, run, run. Everybody scatter, scatter. And I was just gobsmacked. I just said, what the hell is that? It was like he was speaking directly to me. You know, I, I just had this sensation of like I knew this guy. And it turned out that I knew somebody who knew somebody uh, and he was in London. So I went up to this uh, five-star hotel in Victoria and went to the room, walked in and saw Fela sitting there in his speedos as usual, surrounded by beautiful girls, as usual. And uh, I sat down next to him. He was sitting like this and I was sitting there, and I was talking into his ear. And I've got to be honest, I don't remember what was said, but at some point, whatever it was I said, he just turned around and looked at me and just started to laugh, and we just became friends. I can't explain it. At that moment, we became friends. 
you know, I just was overwhelmed by listening to it. It was uh, the most, you know, engaging, exciting, complex, uh, sensual, sexual, driving uh, music I'd ever heard. And the lyrics were in this pidgin English, and they were hugely poetic and lyrical and complex. I mean, they're still complex. You can think about a fellow lyric and never really get your arms around everything it might be that he's talking about. And yeah, I just couldn't stop listening to it. And so to think that, you know, this, this man wrote songs that were you know, that made you want to get up and dance and that, you know, made you incapable of not moving your body and yet the songs were about, you know, having his mother thrown out a window or, you know, ha having his home destroyed or, you know, uh, mocking the army and, 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 and the way they treated the population. You know, it just struck me that it was this uh, hugely rich treasure trove of you know, relevant human experience um, incorporated in a genius body of, of music. Um, and those days I used to do portraits for people in my neighborhood. He lived on the same street with me. His na uh, her name uh, is Ibe Agu. I said, what are you doing here? So I said, ah, I brought this drawing. She said, oh, you are still doing your drawing. So she went inside and brought Fela out. And Fela was feeling groggy, you know, and Fela came out. <laughs> in brief, and his brief was so short, all his public hair was showing. I was so nervous, and my hands were shaking. And he looked at me, and he, you know, you, you just from sleep. And he said, oh, the artist? I said, yes. You know, he said, don't, don't, don't call me sir. You know, I said, yes sir. He said, don't call me sir. He said, let me see. Then my hands started shaking. Then Ibe collected the portrait from me and tore it open because it was wrapped. So Ibe opened it for me and Fela saw it. And the first time in my life I had two words expressed, you know, from Fela. He looked at it and said, wow, god damn. That was the first time I ever had those, those two words. Santi always had a very eclectic, she, she's like one person that could top me on like something that I didn't have yet. Played a lot of Nina Simone I didn't have. And um, she always had these mixtapes of, of African music. And you know, I just see like African mixtape and, her father was such a uh, such a big fan of Fela. She used to always rock Fela in her Jeep. The hypnotic effect that Fela's music had on me, all of 1994 to 96, um, I made it my mission to collect all of his original pressings. You know, back then, you you had to scour the earth. Nothing. There was nothing like the feeling of putting on a Fela song and slowly watching uh, my other DJ friends kind of passive aggressively like inch over towards the turntable and do one of these things like, you know, oh, you know you do, you, you're not gonna find this one. You're not gonna find this in a million years. He was king, he was in his own element. And we wanted to get to know him, and he acted as if he wanted to get to know us. So we determined that the best way was just to invite him and have him over for dinner. So we did, and this uh, began a big negotiation because he said, yes, he'd be happy to come, and you know, he'd bring 50 people. I think it was, you know, what, do you remember what the number was? Over 20. The over 20 people. I think we agreed on a five or six people. You, you got it down to four. Four, did I? Okay, around four people. It didn't matter what I got it down to in the end because the appointed time came and big day glow bus pulled into our driveway and out of it came at least <laughs> 20 people <laughs> and I think more. They brought everything. They brought the shrine to us, essentially. They also gave us a housewarming present, uh, which was a bottle about this big of NNG, Nigerian natural grass, uh, black, pure grass, marijuana. So this day he traveled, and at that time, the compound, Kalakuta, was, was barbed wire. You know, even in Kalakuta, there's still some element of corruption. You know, it wasn't perfect, you know. So some of these gay men will use their, their, their security influence to extort people. Either to get the girls to sex them for free or, you know, or get more influence or maybe get cheaper clothes. You know, they'll get favors because they control the gates. 
So one of the guys now, because Fela wasn't around, he said I won't come in. I said, no, I'm coming in this place. So we started fighting for the gates. Anyway, he, tried, he almost stabbed me. His name was Abayo. So the next day, when Fela came back, I came to, I reported him to, came back and reported him to Fela. Immediately Fela calls, uh, he calls a uh, courtyard. There's a court in the house. And the guy was found guilty and he was really severely punished.